How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. During my broadcast here, I educate you, the public, on genetic and health topics through news stories and interviews. Guests typically include genetic counselors, researchers, doctors, patient advocates, and professors. My guest today is Dr. Biju Parakadan, co-creator and scientific director of the hard science graphic novel Legend of Sumera. So obviously, when I got this book, I was super excited. He's a professor of biomedical engineering with a research lab that specializes in cell and genetic engineering. His discoveries have been published in prestigious journals with patent inventions that have led to the foundation of several companies. He received his bachelor's degree from Rutgers University and a doctorate from the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. In 2012, he was recognized by President Obama with an early career award for scientists and engineer. Now, this is the highest honor bestowed upon young researchers in the country, so pretty big deal. He works in biotechnology research, and his education provides a unique perspective while creating this viable science behind the legend of Sumera. It's great having you on here. Thank you very much, Kira. It's a pleasure. So tell me a little bit about what Legend of Sumer is about. Now, I've read it, but we've got to educate the listeners a little bit. Okay. Uh, well, it's an epic, uh, epic novel. Uh, really, at the heart of it, it's, um, it's focused on, uh, you know, what happens if te technology gets in the wrong hands. Uh, in, in Legend of Sumeria, we talk about two really fast-moving advances. One is, um, let's say, on Earth with respect to uh, genetic technology. And uh, the other is, you know, in space, in terms of space exploration. And, um, you know, there's, there's two, uh, let's call them, you know, heroes, although, you know, the, the, the terms heroes and heroine are a bit, um, uh, you know, hard to define, to be honest, in, in this story. Um, but there's, there's two heroes that, uh, you know, are really making advances in gene therapy and space travel. And uh, there's, let's call them villains that are trying to usurp that. Uh, those advances and reposition them for, um, you know, potentially nefarious, uh, uh, you know, activities. And so we, we talk about this kind of struggle between uh, good and evil um, and, you know, really try to highlight some of these ethical dilemmas that could um, really take shape if, uh, if there's not really a public forum uh, discussing these fast moving technologies. And as you said, there's so many different concepts brought into this book and different layers of things and um it, it's very interesting and i do want to highlight that it is a graphic novel which is very different i haven't read a lot of graphic novels so it was really interesting for me that you have such beautiful artwork along with these really interesting plot lines and characters and how it all comes together what was your inspiration for starting the novel yeah, the you know the graphic novel uh, approach I think um, is something that was was unique in, in the sense that we um, we wanted to have uh, visual aids along with this story, and um, you know I think what's been great is a lot of our readers like you are saying that you know I, I've never read a graphic novel before, but it's really piqued their interest to uh, you know maybe look at this type of um, of uh, artistic method uh, you know in the future. There's been a lot of legendary ones in the past, um, like Mouse and Watchmen and, uh, you know, even the Dark Knight. And we hope to, uh, you know, elevate ourselves to that status and have a, have a mark in graphic novel history. Uh, when it comes to the inspiration, um, you know, it, it really started uh, just as a fun project. Um, I, I'm a scientist by, by day and um, a lot of friends and family are, are not scientists. And they uh, found it um, very amazing that, um, people do research on uh, blood samples. And uh, just that, that simple um, kind of human response that I saw when I was talking about my experiments in the lab, that um, I felt like, oh, th you know, there's a lot of people that find this really interesting, whereas it's, it's pretty commonplace for me. And, um, and so it, that was kind of the seed that uh, sprouted into one of the uh, main major characters of this particular book, uh, Bruce Abbott, who, um, has kind of a blood disorder and, uh, you know, through his own exploration of his 
pathology uh, actually discovers a, uh, uh, a tremendous gene therapy and uh, that, that he then starts to try to um, develop and um, uh, things don't go uh, according to plan, let's say, um, in that development. So it really started with um, really that uh, kind of visual human response that I observed uh, with my friends and family. And at the heart of it, um, you know, it was trying to ask the question of what would society look like if there wasn't this pressure, perhaps the only evolutionary pressure that we have, um, which is infectious disease. You know, human, humans, unlike other species, we're, we're not pressured uh, to evolve by being afraid of, uh, you know, lions anymore or, you know, uh, uh, having to grow ourselves to eat certain plants that, that we, we don't live in that age anymore. Um, but we do live in an age where pretty much the only thing that is, is capable of, of destroying, um, the human race is, is, uh, you know, viruses, bacteria, things that, that really can, uh, cause mass ep epidemics. So, um, it started with the premise of let's eliminate this pressure and how would humans evolve without that evolutionary pressure? And, um, and that was really the question that um, uh, was at the heart of the, the story and uh, gave birth to this society that, that doesn't look a lot, uh, looks very different from how we live today uh, without that, that pressure installed. And you have a lot of that hard science in there so that, you know, even I was reading through this and learning different concepts or some of it was a bit of a refresher and kind of reminding me of certain things. And there's also some adult themes to the book. Who would you say is the target audience for the book? Yeah, uh, well, I think folks like yourself, Kira, I, I, we, we really wanted to make a book that scientists wouldn't um, completely, uh, you know, rebuff and say, oh, this is just, uh, um, you know, a lot of fluff science. We, we, we thought long and hard about uh, trying to add enough real life uh, scientific foundation for which we created a drama around. So uh, I think uh, folks who are scientists, either biologists, physicists, astrophysicists, um, uh, you know, engineers, we hope that uh, this is a, a fun read for them. It's certainly a, you know, a long read. Um, and I think, um, you know, that, that was one group that we were very interested in. Actually, what's been taking uh, even more shape is in the ethics and bioethics field. Um, so students and professors... Um, that are you know interested in, in learning ethics and, and learning new approaches and uh, talking about the ethical um, issues of today are recognizing that Legend of Sumeria is really um, you know one of the first that has used graphic novels and graphic illustration and uh, a, a fictional narrative to actually raise bioethical issues um, to the public and they're pretty fascinated by that and you know kind of in the background. There's a consortium forming um, with a lot of professors around the country and even in the UK, and we're trying to uh, see if we can uh, continue to, um, you know, leverage graphic novels as a as a new uh, educational tool for uh, their college students and graduate students. And I'll pick your brain in a little bit on some of those bioethics and kind of what you explore in the book. But I have to say, when I did, you know, receive this book, I was pretty excited because it's not often that I come across a novel that actually includes a lot of like the science that I'm interested in. And as you said, as I'm reading, I'm not like, yeah, I know this, I know this, I know this. I'm building upon, oh, right, I know this. And now they're connecting it to this. And so it really starts getting very involved on some of the scientific terms and concepts you use are like energy, apoptosis, checkpoints, autoimmunity. Um, so I wanted to kind of do a little mini lesson of you know, what autoimmunity is since it is very central to the plot. Sure. Yeah. I, I, I'm an engineer. I'm a biomedical engineer by training, but I, I do focus a lot of my research around the immune system. Uh, I've always found it fascinating that, you know, it makes a lot of sense that if you have, you know, an organ that fails, like, you know, if you have a heart attack or if you have a uh, kidney failure, it, you're, you're at risk for, 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 for dying. Uh, but the immune system is very different. It's a very, it's a scattered, cellular, non-organized, uh, at least physically, uh, spatially organized system. But it has the power to, you know, really destroy um, uh, someone if, uh, you know, if, if the response is, is strong enough. So, um, you know, I think it's really that um, power that individual immune cells have um, that we try to highlight in this story. And the key is 
we make the analogy that humans, you know, if we if we scale, if we look at this from a very different scale, from a, a, a universal galactic scale, humans look like cells at that very, very uh, zoomed out view of the of the universe. And so if humans and in, in our book, uh, some of them are immune cells, um, we, we want to show the power of. Um, either the protective power or really the dangerous power of that immune cells could have in uh, protecting, you know, the organism, i.e., you know, earth and, and, and the universe or, uh, you know, destroying it. And so autoimmunity, um, you know, at its biological level is really a state where the immune system is attacking oneself. And uh, what triggers that, there's still a very hot, debated and researched um, topic, but that can be because the, uh, of a failure of um, education. So the immune system, when it is, is growing and born, it first needs to get educated on what is self versus foreign or non-self. And um, if it does so correctly, then the immune cells can go out into the peripheral body and, and try to um, survey the body and make sure there's no foreign um, you know, pathogens that, that come into the body. But if it fails at that education, then, and it recognizes self as foreign, well, that's an example of autoimmunity. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's that discrimination between self versus non-self that we, we highlight. And a lot of these terms that you bring up, they all <clears throat> are processes within the immune system, particularly within T cells, which is a cell type within the immune system. And we try to show the life cycle of a T cell and make the analogy of the life cycle of, in, in particular, Bruce Abbott, who's one of the uh, lead characters. And um, so it's that kind of uh, cell to human analogy and, and those sorts of scale that uh, give um, uh, you know, a really interesting perspective that we brought to the table. And it's the narrator, who's a very mysterious figure, um, who's looking at this entire story from that universal scale. And to explain a lot of these scientific concepts in the novel, you have sketches that are like from, you know, one of the characters lab notebooks. And, you know, we've talked about now autoimmunity and, and different things. How much of the novel really is based on this hard science? I mean, you're a scientist yourself and co-wrote this. Yeah, uh, that was something that we, we really uh, wanted to fundamentally root every, uh, you know, scientific fictional aspect of the story with a basis in real science. So uh, a lot of those lab notebook sketches are, um, you know, at the heart of it is how the immune system works. And, um, you know, in the case of uh, energy or checkpoints, um, what we show there is, um, you know, really a doodle of that biological process in real life. And we try to put a poetic spin on it um, by, uh, you know, through the story and through the narration and, and, and certainly through the plot. Um, and, th th you know, it was something that we really tried to uh, stay true to. And in fact, you know, Jay on the creative side would come up with amazing ideas of, hey, you know, what what would happen if, if uh, you know, um, he'd, he'd bring up some particular example of, oh, we, you know, could this character do X or Y or Z? And we wouldn't move forward with that plot development if there wasn't a scientific rationale that I could come up with that, uh, granted, it may not be here now, but if there was some direction or some inkling that that could be feasible within the future, um, then we'd, we'd consider it. If, if not, we would kind of move, uh, move aside and, and go on to the next idea. So that was uh, something that we tried to maintain the scientific integrity, at least as a, as a platform for which we can create a drama off of. Um, and, and that was the process. And the lab notebook pages are examples of the real underlying science um, that is either already known or happening now um, that form the basis of, of some of the, uh, uh, the, the fiction that we, we generated. And it makes it an exciting way to kind of learn all of this and, and, and take it in. Now, one kind of concept in the book is the SEEK network. Um, can you kind of explain you know, the, the science behind it and how it works in the book? Sure, yeah. The, the SEEK network, um, the uh, simplest, most relatable way to uh, understand the SEEK network, network is imagine Facebook, 
but instead of you depositing, you know, your personal information like, you know, how old you are, your name or so on and so forth, instead you are depositing your entire genetic sequence. And through that, you know, a network is born that instead of connecting people based on, you know, similar interests in books or movies, now you're being connected to people because of real molecular genetic links. And that can be both in a positive way or in a negative way. And I think we've seen already examples of type of data collection are taking place, uh, you know, in terms of a number of uh, for-profit and, and also not-for-profit entities that are um, seeking out individuals to either pay or donate uh, their genetic sequence um, to create this kind of broad database, um, as well as we've also seen the uh, incursion of privacy in, in, in many respects in some of these uh, social uh, uh, media and social networking companies. And so we're sort of connecting dots that are existing and trying to point, you know, the audience to a future that might not be so great, which in the legend of Sumeria, there's a lot of, um, you know, unfortunately, there's a lot of discrimination that takes place because of the Sikh net worth. There's a lot of uh, inequality. Um, and there's also a, a lot of, uh, you know, data mining that's not just for advertising, but in fact is, is very targeted, uh, again, for um, a, a sort of malicious um, purpose that I'll, I'll, uh, hold on to the, the reason because it's a it's an important uh it's kind of a spoiler uh to, to figure that all out and as you said we kind of already have these human genome co collections of sorts with different direct consumer companies and other companies how dangerous is it for you know these companies or potentially a government to have really a population's genetic information and you know this is really growing. I mean, genetic testing is, is really skyrocketing. Yeah. Yeah. I think what's, what's really brought on the advent of uh, this age of genetic sequencing that's really, you know, taking off is um, the costs of doing so have come down dramatically through uh, really development of new sequencing technology and it'll continue to do so. Um, so it makes it a lot more uh, reasonable to get your genome sequenced, um, you know, quickly and, and, um, you know, and definitively. And so, you know, there's a lot of positive to it as well. I mean, I think through genetic testing, we're learning about um, different types of uh, diseases. We're learning about, uh, you know, migration histories of, of human beings and, and certainly even animals as well. Um, so, you know, there's really a balanced, you know, I think discussion here, and I don't want to only speak about the negatives, but the danger of it is just like any sort of data collection that's taking place in a in a um, unfiltered way. And it's not so much that the information is dangerous right here and now, but retrospectively, one can paint a picture of anything they want uh, if they have hold of, of uh, people's data. And uh, I think we've, we've seen a case recently that's a very controversial case uh, in the sense of the, um, the Golden State uh, uh, serial killer who was um, identified through a genome sequence that was deposited on one of these, um, uh, G, you know, genetic collection sites. Uh, and this person, you know, allegedly has, has done some egregious things, um, was not found by authorities uh, until they went to this sort of public database and gathered this information and tied two things together. So it's a very controversial case because they, they seemingly, may, the, the authorities seemingly may have circumvented um, you know, a privacy issue, but in the same respect, they caught someone who may have done really terrible things uh, for, for, for decades. And uh, it's instances like that where uh, I, I don't know what is right or wrong, uh, but I just know that um, a line was crossed before there was really even a public discussion about uh, genome collection. And, um, you know, I think there'll be more instances like that if, uh, if there's not really a, a, a voice on the other side talking about how to do this in a moral and ethical way. And I think for him being identified, he was actually identified by comparing his DNA to a family member's that was in the system. I think it wasn't even his own, which brings on even right. more bioethical issues of, all right, if he deposited his own DNA into this, you know, biobank, then maybe he signed a waiver, didn't really understand the fine print of reading it. But 
it wasn't even his DNA. So that, that yeah. kind of brings on so many, we could do a whole episode just on that, I think. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, in the same way that there's a network that's built with people making connections to friends and family, uh, you know, genetics can not infallibly, in fact, you know, there is, there is, uh, it's not a hundred percent accurate. And even in the cases of using it in forensic science, there's been the rare case where someone is positively identified, um, you know, by a genetic sequence. The, the classic example is the European uh, uh, bombings that took place a, a few years ago where someone was ID'd by a, a genetic sequence and it turned out and, and went to jail for it. And it turned out that, um, you know, that same code was shared by someone else who actually did it. Uh, and this person was in jail for two years for something that he never did um, because of um, uh, what's thought to be a infallible test. And so, uh, you know, there's, 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 uh, you know, instances like that and granted they're rare. They're, they're not, you know, this is not happening every day. Um, but, uh, you know, can we do better and can we, um, you know, really channel and deploy, uh, the power of this technology for, um, you know, for, for societal gains that, uh, you know, I think everybody would, would ideally want, uh, it'll never be hundred percent perfect, but I think, um, you know, it's just a, such a powerful and, uh, uh such a, a, a broad, um, technology that it, uh, uh, the shaping of it, you know, I think requires a lot of people to come together from a lot of different fields and, and talk through it, um, uh, and kind of project, uh, as many scenarios as they can, uh, to see how one would respond, um, with, with genetic sequencing in mind. And one way we've been making a lot of strides is with gene therapy, which we kind of mentioned earlier in the episode, but we've been making a lot of progress with, you know, treating. And even I've seen a few articles of, um, you know, kids' genetic diseases being cured. Do you see these breakthroughs happening on a larger scale in the near future? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm a, part of my research career is related to it. <laughs> so I think, um, I, you know, I think gene therapy, um, is really starting to, um, have some successes. There's been a long history of it. Um, and I think through that research, uh, we've learned how to do this a lot safer. And right now the focus is on, uh, clear disorders where there's one genetic mutation that is driving, you know, pathology. And can we, modify that genetic mutation um, by, you know, many different approaches to correct that uh, once and for all. And so it has this curative nature um, at, at its heart, which is great. Um, and, but in the same respect, you know, the expansion of gene therapies, um, which is really starting to, you know, accelerate, um, you know, can be unbounded w without, um, you know, a, you know, I think a, a, a public discourse around it. So one thing, you know, that has come up numerous times, and um, again, there hasn't been development of it, but, uh, you know, it, it's something that is worth discussing, is the power of gene editing using CRISPR technology, which I know your show has covered in a, a number of um, respects. And, um, you know, how real feasible it is to edit an embryo. Uh, you know, it's been demonstrated actually in, in research labs um, and so, you know, it starts to get into a blue gene therapy starts to get into a blurry line where, you know, maybe we're treating things that we don't necessarily know will develop into a pathology. Um, and we, 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 uh, uh, or it could be even, you know, purely aesthetic and cosmetic things. Uh, I don't know where, where that line is drawn. Um, but, uh, you know, there's already been, um, you know, overtures from the national academies about, uh, gene editing of embryos and, and the allowance of that for certain uh, cases, but uh, it's it's not uh, as defined as it potentially uh, could be or should be at this point. And we talk about that in Sumeria. Uh, there's a gene therapy that looks like a cure-all. It really pr prevents people from um, having, uh, you know, infections and uh, prevents against some of the biggest scourges uh, that we face today, things like malaria and HIV and uh, you know, those types of viral and, and bacterial infections. But in the same respect, it has all of these uh, side effects that, um, so there's risk and reward. And, uh, you know, in, in the society uh, within the book, uh, they tolerate these, um, these side effects. Uh, but lo and behold, those side effects really um, 
change the behavior of uh, the society to make them a lot more uh, risk taking, uh, a lot more, um, uh, let's say, uh, you know, mentally um, unstable. And so, you know, I think these are some of the uh, uh, cases where it's, you know, it's a gray area. Um, you know, if a cure all comes with, uh, you know, a lot of these side effects and untold um, downstream consequences, um, you know, is that something that is right for everybody? Um, it's, it's really just, I, I think through the story, we just try to raise these questions without prescribing an answer because I, I certainly know uh, that we don't have one. Um, they're, they're very complex issues. And even if you take gene ed- or gene therapy or editing, I guess, either way, um, from a perspective of let's say that it works and, you know, the, the science is there and everything, is it going to create a divide between people who can afford these treatments and those who cannot, where you're going to start having poorer people be more affected by disease? Because right now it's, you know, all kind of similar. But once you start introducing technologies like these, that that may not be the same. And that's something else yeah. you, you raise in the book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, in the case of uh, the Naima Corporation, which owns the Seek, Seek Network and owns everyone's genetic code, <clears throat> you're either with them or you're not with them. And if you're not with them, then you don't get access to medicine. Uh, you don't get access to these gene therapies. Uh, you don't get it, even access to, you know, the social network, uh, which is the Seek Network, to, to get a job. Um, you know, so, so every... Uh, thing in the society within this book is tied to a genetic code in the same way that, you know, LinkedIn, you can find someone professionally um, and find a job based on your merits. Well, in using the Seek Network, you find a job because, you know, you have, uh, you know, a homozygous deletion in uh, your your 12th chromosome and and third allele, and that makes you suited to be, um, you know, a a teacher in this future. Uh, And so, if you, it, you know, those sorts of divides, uh, in, in our example, in the case of medicine and technology, uh, can really cause a, a, you know, a tremendous wedge, uh, between, um, you know, the haves and haves nots. So we, 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 we do describe that and, um, and gene therapy at the moment is, uh, you know, pretty highly priced. And, uh, part of my own personal research is to bring the cost down through, uh, you know, methods of uh, learning how to manufacture these things uh, at scale cheaply. Uh, but uh, but you're right, it's something that um, as much as it takes off and makes a lot of progress, um, there's, you know, not a lot of people who can, uh, you know, afford it. And the, the hope is that's how a lot of things start. And the hope is it can, um, you know, become cheaper and more affordable to a lot of, um, you know, the general public and in, in even developing countries. But it's... Um, you know, it'll take some time and it'll take a lot of people, you know, really kind of coming together and thinking about that problem. Definitely. And and we've seen that with genetic testing, uh, that that has dramatically gone down of sequencing, um, was so astronomically expensive and has plummeted, you know, in the last decade or so. Um, but I, I think you've hooked our listeners in terms of, you know, what they're (laughs) interested in and you really raise a lot of bioethical questions that we could, we could go on and on, but, um, can they expect any more graphic novels from you guys? Or is this kind of uh, maybe not public information yet? I'm kind of peeking in a little bit. Oh, no, by all means. Um, I think the real, the real question is, is for our, our readers. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a growing base. And the more uh, folks that are out there and demanding, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the sequel to this, um, you know, it's a little bit of a, a, a giveaway. But this story is actually one of three parts interesting if uh, if folks want to hear about the second and third part and i really hope they do because it's uh you know we we laid a lot of seeds that are going to grow into some really interesting interesting plants in the second and third book um we we love to serve our our fan base and um you know i think if there's that demand uh jay and i and our illustrative team are, are ready to uh, uh you know supply the the next version hopefully with um you know, a lot of uh, great uh, uh, publishers that come on board as well. And one way you guys can stay tuned with um, what they're up to is following them on social media at Legend of Sumera on Twitter and Instagram um, and their website as well, um, legendofsumeria.com. And we are going to do a giveaway um, for the book. So if you go onto their Instagram and you follow them and comment on their post about this podcast episode, 
um, if you are one of the first five to comment and saying what you think is the most bioethical kind of interesting thing that we talked about on today's episode and maybe commenting and springboarding off one of our points. Um, so comment something that was bioethically interesting to you from this episode on their Instagram post about this episode. And if you're one of the first five to do it, you will actually um, win one of the physical copies of this book. And again, it's it is quite an interesting and unique book, so I do recommend it. If you don't end up winning, um, you can purchase it uh, on their website and everything. So um, thanks so much for coming on and kind of exploring this with me. And uh, it, it really is a cool book. I think you guys would like it. Thank you, Kira. No, it was it's uh, really an honor to to be on your on your show, and uh, you know I happy to do it again. Uh, you know for the next one. That that sounds like a great plan. You guys can learn more about the show at dnapodcast.com. All episodes are on there, including maybe in the future, our sequel episode. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at DNA Podcast. Instagram, at DNA Radio. And don't forget the giveaway on Instagram. Questions for both of us can be sent to info at dnapodcast.com. So thanks for listening, guys. And join me next week to learn and discover the new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me. The genes of you and me. are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.